What's the word, y'all? The 2021-2022 NBA season is over, man. We did it. We got to this point. Whether you're rooting for the team that had the best record in the league or you're rooting for the team that had the worst record in the league, there's so many things we could take away from the season and just smile about. I would go out on the limb and say this was definitely a really good season. I enjoyed so many days of it. But the last day of the NBA season is always really, really wild. We have some crazy, crazy performances because majority of the teams already know they're not playing for something or whether they already secured their whatever spot in the playoffs or their team that's tanking so many people sat out today so many people sat out today let me read you some of my favorite uh stat lines from the day O'Shea Brissett 28 8 and 3 shout out to him Kevin Love had a 32 10 and 2 game in less than 15 minutes bro put a little over a quarter worth of basketball out there and he had 32 10 and 2 and then Mamu you like who no Mamu from the uh, Milwaukee Bucks, had a 28-13 and four game. Jalen Green ended his rookie season on the bang, dropping a 41 piece. John Conchar put together, yes, J Illinois' very own John Conchar put together the last triple double of the regular season. This is crazy. Emmanuel, Qu oh wait, Emmanuel quickly also got a triple double. But which game ended first? Hmm, I don't know which game ended first. I think Quickly's game might have ended after John Contra. So, John Contra, congratulations on the first career triple-double, but you didn't have the last one of the season because I feel like Emmanuel Quickly did it with his 34, 10, and 12. And, oh, his teammate, Obi Toppin, dropped 40-something. The, <laughs> the last day of the season is crazy. Victor Oladipo went all the way back to the Indiana days. He dropped 40. I'm not done. Shake Melton had 30. B-Ball Paul had 25. Luca Garza had a 20-10 game. Patrick Williams shot every shot, and he had 35. Like, it, it was um, crazy, and Luca hurt himself. I, don't, I, I hate to, like, damper the mood, but Luca got hurt. And if it's anything of anything, what the hell are we doing? I know that the Mavericks – had an opportunity to jump up a seed if they won in the Warriors' loss. But what the hell are we doing? And I think when he got injured, they were up by a decent amount of points. It's just, ah, Luca, I hope that this is nothing and we can we can just look past this because it can be an all-time fail from the coaching staff for even having him on the court. Oh, oh, I forgot. I'm sorry. Amir Coffey had 35. And then a the guy named uh, Xavier Simpson. Uh, I think this is the six-foot guy with the hook shot. He has 17, 9, and 7 for OKC. Those are the craziest performances of the day because nobody was really playing. And we did see some shenanigans. Today's video, we're going to talk about playing and stuff, but we did see some shenanigans, man. The Bucs, every, everybody saw what you did, my boy. You were not being slick with this one. The Bucs decided to rest everybody against the Cavaliers today because um, they wanted to avoid the play-in teams. And there, there's probably one that's a little bit heavier than others, right? Uh, people are trying to avoid the Brooklyn Nets. And the Bucks, the Bucks did that. And I was surprised, man, because last year they did it, right? Um, two years ago, they went against the Miami Heat in the playoffs. And I'm pretty sure we're talking about the bubble where, where the Miami Heat went on to the uh, to, to the championship game. Um, the Miami Heat made the Bucks look foolish. And I just remember pe seeing people question Giannis's greatness. Oh, can he really do it? He can't get past Miami Heat. And then the next season, the Bucks going into the last game, had an opportunity to completely avoid Miami in the first round. But guess what they did? They played everybody. They was like, you know what? If we going to go through or we're going to have to win this conference and win this championship, we got to beat Miami one way or another. So bring us Miami in the first round. And they scraped them boys. So I just thought a Coach Bud slash Giannis team was not going to be afraid of nobody. I was wrong. But I don't blame them. I don't blame them. If I was a coach and I was a general manager and I'm thinking about the grander picture of these things, I don't want to have to face these demons in the first round. And I'm talking about KD and Kyrie Irving, number 11 and number 7-11. Them boys go great. Would I, would I rather go against those two dudes or skidding Chicago Bulls team? Seems like an easy pick. If I could get rid of one team in 4-5 or five, and then kind of chill and see the next team in the second round, I would do that 100% of the time too. But I was just surprised that the Bucks did it. That's all. Hey, before we get deep into this, I want to remind you that we have a newsletter, the Enjoy Basketball newsletter. It's just it's uh, by NBA fans for NBA fans. Monday, Wednesday, Friday. If you uh, follow the newsletter, you're going to get a a write up of the previous night's games, um, just from some of the best in the world. And we're trying to get to I think we're trying to get to twenty five thousand, and we're just a little way away. So if you have not subscribed, go ahead and do it, and be sure to read those emails because uh, we drop it on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. It's free. Did I mention that? It's free. So do your thing. Anyway, with all that being said, the play in was set today and I'm very interested we will make an entire video talking about the overall playoffs that don't start and hey listen this is what I'm gonna say if you look at the official NBA website I right, people be like Kenny it's all semantics I always say the play in is not the playoffs 
right? If you are a play-in team, you didn't make the playoffs until your top eight seed. And if you go to the NBA website, it says play-in starts April 12th. Playoffs start April 16th. So, you know, we're talking about the play-in. We will make a video talking about the entirety of the playoffs once we know who the four teams are going to fill the 7-8 spot for show for show. And I know some of y'all are looking for those other videos. Quick housekeeping, just really, really quick. Um, I was trying to do award week last year, but some of y'all know that I'm expecting my kid any day now. And if you have a kid, you know that they give you a day, but it's literally like hour to hour, day to day. So some things came up, and we will talk about my MVP. We will talk about my sixth man of the year and most improved player eventually. But out the playoffs are here, I would much rather focus on that. But believe looking out for those videos too um there's a 7-8 matchup of brooklyn versus cleveland the 9-10 is atlanta versus charlotte then out west it's minnesota versus this uh clippers in the 7-8 and then the 9-10 it is the pelicans versus the spurs and i will honestly say i've been a huge fan of the plan since it was incorporated but i do think there's one major flaw in it and i think a lot of people have pointed this out there needs to be a games back threshold for example, if we're looking at the Western Conference standings, the Minnesota Timberwolves ended this year with a four-game difference between them and the eighth seed. Um, and shout out to the Clippers for oh my god, I did not realize the Clippers finished that strong on a five-game streak. Last time I checked, this was not four games. I think it was five games or six games. But it felt like for a lot of it that the Minnesota Timberwolves they feel like a guaranteed playoff team. And I don't know if they should be fighting for that spot because they have been significantly better than the field. Now, your argument against this is that, Kenny, they just got to win one of two games and they'll be straight. It's all right. But I want to remind you of the, the Warriors team. Was that last year where 7 eight matchup is Lakers versus Warriors? It ended up being an amazing game. Lakers versus Warriors. LeBron James concussed, I guess, said, I saw three rims out there. I threw it at the middle one. And then the Warriors lose. They're like, oh, no big deal. They just got to win one game against the, the Memphis Grizzlies. And they lost. They lost. Um, I mean, I, I guess I'm not too mad about that. But I just feel like there has to be some type of games back threshold. Basically what they did in the bubble, it made so much sense in the bubble. I don't know why they wouldn't continue it. And, of course, it's for special circumstances because in the Eastern Conference, everything is so jumbled. We're talking about one game difference between the 7 and the 10. So in that case... There, there is no there is no games back then. All four of these people are competing for those last two spots. But in the other case, Minnesota secures number seven, and then the last three teams fight for eight. How the hell do you do that? I think that the nine and ten play, and then the winner of nine and ten goes against eight. And then that's how you figure it out. Either way, I'm so excited. I love one game eliminations. And that's one reason I'm a huge fan of March Madness. And this is our mini version of March Madness. And I saw somebody on Twitter talking about it, um, how many young players we will be seeing and like the future of the NBA um, is going to be on display. And some of it is the future or the future and the now. Like Darius Garden is the future, but he was just an all-star. Or Trey Young is the future, but he's already a two-time all-star. Melo Ball, already an all-star. If you like, take a look out west, it's like Ant. It's it's Cat. It's D'Angelo Russell. Paul George is old. But, like, it's Brandon Ingram. It's DeJounte Murray. Just a lot of our up-and-coming star players in the league are getting to be on national TV. One-game elimination. I'm sure we're going to get some good performances. I will say that this has always been something for the two years. It's been a thing. I've been wrong a lot about my predictions, low-key. Uh, because it's a one-game elimination. You can talk all you want about matchups and boom, 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 boom. Anything can happen in one singular game. Right, so I'm looking at like the first matchup being the seventh seed and the eighth seed, Brooklyn Nets versus Cleveland Cavaliers. If you look at the regular season, the the Brooklyn Nets beat them three out of four times, but there was that fourth time where the Cavs won. Also, but I, I do I I don't want to bury the lead. The one time that the Cavs won, Kevin Durant didn't didn't play, and I'm going to assume that Kevin Durant will will play in this one. But one thing that is a huge if for me. And that obviously dramatically changes um, the opinions or the thoughts about it is whether or not Jared Allen will be ready to play. I think J.B. Bickerstaff was asked about it today or yesterday, and he said, we're not completely sure. We're trying to figure things out. I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but he says something similar to that. And, of course, him being on there would dramatically increase their chances. But I don't think that the Bucks were trying to avoid Cleveland, Atlanta, or or Charlotte. I think that that's the one team up top, the Brooklyn Nets. And if I'm trying to pick, I'm going to pick between our 7A matchup. My prediction is going to be a Brooklyn Nets win. Which well, is unfortunate, man, because the majority of the season, the Cavaliers have been a team that was top six until we got to like the last two weeks. And they just been dealing with, if we're talking about any team of this year who had the worst injury luck, it is 1000% the Cavaliers. It's not even, I don't, you can't, to me, you can't even make an argument for anybody else. You can't make an argument for anybody else. They missed Jared Allen for like two months. Um, Darius Garland missed a couple weeks with some back stuff. 
Uh, Kyle Saxon got injured very early in the season. Ricky Rubio's having a resurgence of his career, and he got a season into injury. Karis Aver got traded to the team, and then a week later, he got injured. Larry Marketing got injured for two weeks at a time. Like, they have had so many injuries injuries and if there's any silver line in Cavs fans if you if you lose this game you still got one more to make it work but even if you lose that when you know that next year you're going to have the fro and DG10 back together for an entire season and hope that that year is healthy you're going to have Laurie Marketing back you're, you're going to have Evan Mobley back a, a year or two of Evan Mobley might be dangerous you feel me um and I didn't even mention that he missed some some crucial time in the last couple weeks of the season so um I, I'm not rooting for anybody obviously um, but you know what? I would say majority of the fans are probably rooting for the Cavs because uh, I, I know that there are teams out there afraid of the Brooklyn Knights, and they would rather have somebody else deal with the dirty work instead of going against that team in a seven-game series. But again, anything can happen in the seven. I've seen games this year where KD dropped 50, and they lost. You know what I'm saying? I've seen that this year. So anything is possible. But if I had to make a prediction, I'm going Brooklyn Nets. Oh, a game just wrapped up. Klay Thompson had 40. So there's there's Clay looking looking good as ever. Give Clay any shot he wa he wants, and he can drop a forty piece. All right, let's keep it in the Eastern Conference. Talking about this nine ten, I am going to go out on limb and say it's like if you want to mm, actually maybe I don't want to if you want to get a casual fan into the game of basketball, let them watch Atlanta versus Charlotte because we talking one sixty to one sixty three. Like that's the type of game we about to see, bro. These teams do not defend very well, but we got some very very high powered offenses. I do want to give a lot of love to Trey Young and the Atlanta Hawks, though, because well, they're doing similar things than last year, but it just it took them a lot later to do it. But in the last month or so, the Atlanta Hawks have been really, really good. I'm trying to look at it right now. They've had, ooh, Kenny, see, this is why you got to look at the last two weeks. I'm on cleaning the glass, and it said over the last two weeks, the Atlanta Hawks are 6-2, and two, and they are 3rd in offense and 11 in defense. That defense is a lot better than I expected it to be. Charlotte, on the other hand, are 7 in offense and 18th in defense. I've talked about this before, but somebody did a research that's saying that the way you end your regular season is not indicative of how you play in the playoffs and stuff. But this is not the playoffs. It's just one game. And if you approach it at one game, maybe this stuff does matter. I don't know. If I were to make a prediction, though, on this, I think I'm going with Atlanta. I, th mm, I think I'm going with Atlanta. Both of the teams ended exactly the same. Exactly same record. Huh. I, I'm going to go with Atlanta just because Trey Young is amazing. And I've seen him in big pressure situations and I've seen him perform to the highest value or the highest degree. And the Charlotte Hornets were playing team last year and they let the Indiana Pacers, if I'm not mistaken, drop like 150 points on them. Like, like I know I'd be, I was exaggerating when I said, oh, it's going to be 160 to 163. No. If I remember correctly, the Pacers put up like 145 points last year in the playing game. And they were like, it was one game elimination and Charlotte gave up 145 points. You know what I'm saying? Some teams are able to snap on the defense. The Charlotte Hornets haven't necessarily been that team. And I th and I think that Atlanta could be that team. Just because I've seen them in those playoff series snap on the defense. So I guess I'm going to Atlanta. Let me go look at the regular season series. Let me is that gonna change my opinion? In the regular season, it was a 2-2 split. Oh, snap. 2-2 split. And only one of these games was even close. All of them were like blowouts for whatever, whoever won the, t the game. Interesting. Okay. All right. But which one was the newest one? The, the most recent one? The most recent one was a Charlotte win. A 10-point win for Charlotte where basically everybody was healthy for Atlanta. And Charlotte had their entire lineup too. Post-trade that line. Montrez Harrell was here. He had a 20-piece. Ooh, I don't know if that changes things. Hey, listen, I'm not a prediction guy. I make predictions for the sake of the video. But I, listen, I don't stand on my predictions. I'm not rooting for anybody. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. I just want good basketball or fun basketball. Because this might not be, this is going to be not great basketball, but fun basketball. Does that make sense? Because I think the best version of basketball is when it is a little bit gritty. And this don't feel very gritty to me. All right, let's go over to the Western Conference. Like I said, we got Minnesota versus the Clippers. And even though I say, like I said, the Minnesota Timberwolves feels like a team that should be solidified in the playoffs. The Clippers, bro, I, I, I have learned my lesson when writing these boys off. The Minnesota Timberwolves have had the best offense as far as total points scored this entire season. I saw that graphic today during the Bulls game where Minnesota has scored the most total points amongst any team. And I guess that don't really mean anything. <laughs> I guess it don't mean anything in the grand scheme of things, but it's just a cool stat. But in the last two weeks... Um, they've had the worst 
spread differential in the entire league. They have had the 16th best offense and the 28th best defense, which is not very normal for them because for a good portion of the season, they were a top 10 defense. But as we completed 82 games in, uh, they ended up with the 13th best defense, which is still a lot better than I think a lot of people expected it. But with the players they have on their team, they feel like a team that definitely could lock in on defense when they need to. The one thing I see with this team, um, and I've seen it a lot, is like, like, you know, they'll go up on a little run going into the first half, and then you put a little bit of pressure on them, and then they don't know how to react. They they go droughts without scoring the ball. And I feel like this Clippers team is a team that is good on putting that pressure. Like, this Clippers team would be down by 16 and be like, we good. We still in this. You know? So those two, those are like the opposing things. And if I had to take – a guess on who I think is going to win this game. I'm going with many. I think I'm going. I think I'm going with many Minnesota on this one. I think I'm going with Minnesota. I do believe the Clippers are probably going to still stay the eight seed. You know, winning game number two, whatever that is. But I do believe that Minnesota can pull out this one. But I would not be surprised the Clippers just clamped up and won this one, especially with Paul George being back and him when he has played, he's looked pretty good. And currently they're on a five game streak. Does that mean something? Does it mean nothing? I don't really know. And then the nine ten matchup. Um, we have the the Pelicans who are, you know, 36 and, and 45. But I do want to say this in defense of the Pelicans. They started off the season like 3 and 16 or something. But since then, they've been like an average basketball team. You know, I know they're 10 games below 500, but they've been like an average basketball team. If you get rid of <laughs> the 3 and 16 or whatever, it was something wired like that. So the fact that they turned their season around to even be in this place is crazy. And I heard, it might have been on the Zach Lowe's podcast, he were talking about the Lakers. I'm, this is supposed to be not, I was talking about the Lakers. But it was just uh, basically saying that the Lakers are crazy for even allowing this to happen. For the Pelicans to be in so much of a hole, the, as big of a hole as you can be in and crawl out of it. And of course, being under 500, still making a play in is kind of crazy. But the Lakers let them do it. But they won today. Shout out to Malik Monk with a little 30 piece. Um, the Pelicans are a really good team, but so are the Spurs. Both teams are good coached. Um, or one of them is a great coach. It, it, Willie Green is a really good coach, too, I, I've seen throughout the season. If I were going to guess, though, DeJounte Murray has been out for a couple games now because he got, like, really sick, I guess. Not COVID-related, but he got really sick, I guess. He was tweeting about things, but I'm guessing that he's going to be available to play in this play-in because um, they're going to need him, even though they have been they can play okay without him. Obviously, he's their all-star. He's their, he's their everything, basically. Um, but in this series, hmm, on this game, this is how crazy it can be. It's just like I'm taking – flip flip the coin. Where's the coin? I'm flipping I'm flipping a virtual coin, like no joke. I'm going to say the Pelicans are heads and the Spurs are tails. We're going to flip, and it's telling me to go with the Spurs. So, Spurs Nation, you have my pick for this 7 or this 9-10 matchup. Only thing I hope for is that every single one of these games is a good one. Um, last year – we had a few stinkers. Um, of course, we had a couple good ones, and the good ones definitely make you forget about the stinkers, but there there were some stinkers in that, you know what I'm saying? And I think that the teams that we do have match up well enough where we should, hopefully, have four really solid games, you know? Four really solid games. That's all we can really hope for, man. In the comment section, let me know what you think. Who is your winners of the play-in tournament? And then I cannot wait to talk about these matchups, bro, because Philly versus Toronto, I am trying to rack my brain around this series. It was already hard enough. And now with this Matisse Thybul stuff coming out, if you don't know, Matisse Thybul won't be able to play at least in the first two games in Toronto because he didn't get his second shot. And it's mandatory for you to get your shots um, in order to enter Canada. <sighs> Matisse not being there is a huge, huge miss. And a huge, huge, you know what I'm saying? Something that they desperately need. I don't know who I'm picking in the series just yet, but it, it's, it, it will be a series, you know. I know that Philly has Joel, who, who might be MVP, and they have James, who's been the top 15, 20 player this season. But not having Matisse and some of the track record on some of the Philly teams once playoff time come around, it can't, hey, I'm just saying, I, I, ain't, I ain't made my decisions just yet. It's up in the air at the moment. I still got to think about it a little bit more, but eventually we will. Um, so, like I said, for the playoffs, my goal is to drop these videos daily or near daily talking about the things that I saw, just overall giving recaps and stuff. But again, my daughter could be here any day between now and the next 10 days. So if she does come, then expect me not to upload for those days because 
I will be at a hospital in the delivery room. Um, and then when I come home, probably going to be a dad, a, at least a little bit before I get back to recording videos. But I'll be watching the games for show for show. So we might have one big ass recap where I talk about seven games that I miss. Regardless, I appreciate you watching. Thank you so much for the support. Hit that link in the description. Follow the newsletter. And I'll see you all tomorrow. I'm out.